So as you can see, the title here is uh, Genotype Information Criteria for Forensic DNA Databases. Really what that means is I'm going to talk about is just information in genotypes, um, particularly mixtures, and how our lab applies that type of data um, to database searches. So when we're talking about database searches, right, we're typically talking about CODIS. Um, so as a reminder, with CODIS, we're doing an allele to allele comparison, a direct comparison of alleles in one profile to another. Um, the results are, of course, are based on the selected match stringency, based on your specimen category, uh, based on the, the search criteria that the specific search is set up for. Um, and so this type of a direct allele comparison works really, really well for high certainty genotypes. Um, such as single source samples or deduced major contributors. But with low certainty genotypes, um, such as mixtures, well, how well does it work? And that really depends upon um, the amount of data that you've entered into this system, right? How much data have you put up into your profile? Um, but unfortunately, because of the way the direct allele comparison works, um, there are certain controls that the software has, obviously, uh, to prevent a large number of adventitious matches. And so um, as a reminder, just here are the endus upload criteria just for forensic mixtures, right? So at a forensic mixture, we're, we're limited to four alleles per locus uh, with a moderate match estimation of one in 10 million. Uh, we also now have obviously the forensic targeted uh, locus with a moderate match, or I'm sorry, a, a match rarity estimate of the same of one in 10 million those, of course, being calculated on the original CODIS Core 13 loci. But what happens, though, uh, if you have mixtures that have really high information in them, um, but they don't meet the endus upload criteria, right? Maybe you, you have more than four alleles, or maybe you can't get your MME down uh, or high enough to, to get that into the database. And really for that matter, how do you even identify mixtures with high match information in the first place? Um, you know, you start looking at things like this and maybe you just think these kind of samples, we should just avoid them altogether, right? Um, too much data, too much, too much uncertainty. What do I put in? I don't know. But fortunately, uh, we can use probabilistic genotyping uh, to determine suitability for direct allele comparison searches in CODIS. And in fact, we do that in our laboratory here. And so one of the ways that we do it, the tools that we use is the, the KL, the kullback liebler uh, divergence. Uh, and you can, that's a, 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 a function that's calculated, I guess, with Bayesian methods. And really all it is is just a measure of the information that's gained after performing a Bayesian analysis on a data set. So in other words, uh, it gives us an idea of how much more we know about the data after the computers looked at it versus what we knew about the data before the computer looked at it. So you tell you you have your data set that you start with, you give it to the computer, you let the computer look at it. When the computer's done, the computer tells you, okay, this is how much more information gain. This is the measure of gain or what more that, that the computer knows about the information after it's processed it. Uh, and so there's some advantages actually to using this uh, with databases. So the KL is an estimate of the match information in the absence of a reference sample, right? So we can process a sample. Um, we can do a Bayesian analysis on a, on a DNA profile. Uh, we don't need a reference sample to do that. And the computer will, will process it just fine and it'll calculate a KL and it'll give us an idea of what kind of a likelihood ratio we can expect if we ever get a matching reference sample. And if we have a reference sample for comparison, what kind of a, a match score can we can get? So a low KL suggests or predicts a low match score while a high KL predicts you know, a high match score. Uh, something else that's uh, an advantage too is that the KL is calculated over the entire profile or the entire data set uh, rather than just a subset of loci, right? The MME is calculated over the original CODIS Core 13 loci but the, the KL is calculated over every locus that shows data 
in the profile. So you, if you have a mixture with one of our, our new expanded sets, obviously there's a heck of a lot more information there um, than in the original CODA score th 13. So the KO will be calculated and will tell you how much information you have over the entire set. Uh, and for that reason, we can use that uh, to identify high information mixtures. And this is how we do it. So the first thing we do is um, our, our standard lab method is that we process all samples on a plate in Trulial. So everything gets run in a, in a batch database request. We'll set the number of, of unknowns to um, solve for based upon the initial data. And we'll just batch it and run it. For a plate, it takes a few hours. Not a big deal. Uh, when, as it's done, or when it's done processing, it's, it has assessed the KL of every inferred genotype for every sample on the plate. Uh, and then we determine from that just by uh, briefly looking at the KL of CODIS. So this is, or for CODIS, this is our screening method. So if it's less than 10, um, we found through our experience a genotype, an inferred genotype of, of less than 10 is typically insufficient um, for us to um, tease out a profile uh, for upload to, to CODIS. Um, if it's greater than or equal to 10, that's usually something that we can work with. Uh, it may only get us to state. Uh, we may not be able to get the national depending upon uh, what the actual data is, um, but we usually get something good out of that. Um, and and uh, so the direct allele, I guess, functionality here for the, the the KLs that are less than 10, you know, a KL of 10 is a, a likelihood ratio of roughly 10 billion. That's a good profile. There's a lot of information there, but it's really the, the CODIS functionality and the direct allele comparison. When we get to a KL less than that, we start looking at it, you know, having a lot of alleles that we have to sort through. We may end up having more than four on this, or we may not be able to get a good MME. Um, so in our experience, greater than or equal to 10, we can usually get something from that. So this is an example of how useful the KL can be and how much information it provides to us. So this is data from our laboratory of 33 separate CODIS hits uh, that we've made in our lab. And the blue bars on the left of the graph, that is the, those are the log of the moderate match estimate or the MME. So a bar showing a log MME of four is roughly, or is, I'm sorry, is the same as an MME of 10 to the fourth. Um, a log MME of five is an MME of 10 to the fifth and so on. Uh, and what you can see immediately from this is that the log MME values in this graph range from roughly four to roughly six. So all of these matches that we got back were returned either at Eldis or at Estes. None of these are Endis matches. Uh, the orange bar in the middle of each set is the KL as calculated by true allele, uh, while the green bar on the right is the log of the likelihood ratio. And uh, a couple of things, but first, what should immediately uh, be evident is that in general, the log LR, the green bar, tracks fairly well with the KL, the orange bar, right? In other words, the KL from the start is predicting about how strong the match should be. Uh, one of the things you may notice is that some of the orange KL bars are a lot higher than the green log LR bars. And in these matches, um, these are ones where our sample here in our lab was amplified with one of the expanded loci kits. So uh, it was would have been either PowerPlex Fusion 6C or Global Filer. Um, but the matching offender sample was only one with Profiler, Cofiler, or with Identifiler. So there are fewer loci available for comparison in the reference sample. So the, the, the likelihood ratio, the log LR is going to be lower because, right, because we have fewer loci actually being compared between the two, but the KL is going to be higher because it's expanded across the entire, uh, I'm sorry, it's calculated across the entire data set of our um, profile that we ran in our laboratory here. So, excuse me, if we had had the um, for these where you see a big discrepancy between the orange bar and the green bar, if we had had um, those offender profiles submitted to us for confirmation, then these bars would have been much closer um, 
in, in height. So um, an example of how this information can be used is shown here. So this is a case example. This is a case that we worked in our lab. Uh, it's an assault case, a female victim, a male suspect. Um, we had three question swabs that we ran in this case. Uh, we did not have a victim sample at the time. Um, so this is how it, it turned out. We, the three samples we had, the first sample, sample number one, was roughly 300 picograms of DNA, which we can amplify here. We ended up with a two-person mixture, mixture weight of roughly 60-40. Um, the second pro, uh, sample, we had about 170 picograms, which we did amplify, but got a uh, very minimal result. There wasn't really much we could do with that at all. Uh, the third sample just didn't have enough um, DNA for us to amplify, so we, we did nothing with it. So we had uh, one sample that we were working with here, um, and you know, a roughly 60-40 mixture. So the examiner obviously focused on item one. That was the only one that, that he had that could, could tell him anything. Uh, performed a manual data review here um, and selected 14 loci, eight of them being core for entry. Uh, unfortunately, the data that was chosen did not give us a sufficient MME that we could use to get it up to Endus. So we had to go to Estes instead. Uh, oh, also I need to point out that uh, we had worked this sample in our regular process, so we had done a databasing run through Trulial prior to this point, but uh, we just didn't use it uh, for selecting data for upload to, um, to Estes. This was all based on, on manual human review. So we sent it up in June of uh, 2017, and our first search had 28 candidate matches. Um, so as you can imagine, 28 candidate matches with a human review took, uh, took more than an hour to sort through. Um, unfortunately, uh, of the 28 candidate matches, 25 were eliminated right off the bat. Uh, three of those candidates, uh, the examiner or the reviewer, I should say, uh, could not determine based upon human review whether they were eliminated. So we asked our Estes to amplify the offender samples with their expanded loci kit so we could get more information out of them. Uh, the expanded loci testing was complete the next month in July. All three candidates were excluded, unfortunately. Um, so at this point, we had 28 candidates that we went through. We had zero hits, uh, and we had an hour and a half of time spent uh, with data entry and review, and basically we got nothing for all of this work that we did. There was nothing at all. Um, fortunately, in October of that year, the investigators submitted the victim standard. And since we'd already previously identified or assessed the data, the evidence profile in truly, oh, I'm sorry, um, we, all we had to do at this point was compare the victim standard um, that we ran and found a, a match in true allele to a, a log LR of 14.8 or a likelihood ratio of roughly 630 trillion. Uh, the examiner then again uh, manually refined the CODIS profile, so um, subtracting out the obvious victim alleles and then assigning obligates and, and so forth manually again. Uh, unfortunately, our MME at this point was still not sufficient for us to send it up to Endus. So the edited profile was resubmitted to Estes. Uh, search number two in October, we had two brand new candidate matches that were not seen in the initial search. Uh, one candidate was eliminated and one candidate was identified and, and confirmed um, through human review. So the summary again here now was two candidates, one hit around 15 minutes of, of time, which isn't terrible. Uh, but of the, the total searching we had, we had 30 candidates, only one hit obviously, around two hours of, of time spent and four months in the search process. But the worst part of all was that the offender, the person that we needed to find was not identified in the initial search. So um, 
that was not good. So looking back at this, uh, the time investment that we made in it, the failure to return the match the first time around, we asked, you know, are there any ways that we can improve our process, right? Can we do this better? What, what can we do to make this work better for us? So we thought, well, okay, you know, the biggest time investment was all of that review time. You know, we spent around two hours or so working on this. What if we had used True Allele to review the candidate matches? Would that help us at all? Would that cut any time? And so this slide shows the results from the first match, that, or the first search, I'm sorry, that was done in June 2017. Uh, the blue bars that are going to the left are the negative log LR scores, right? So each one of these bars represents a, a log LR comparison between the inferred genotype from the evidence uh, compared to uh, one of the candidate matches, okay? So these are the 25 that we looked at. The blue bars going to the left are the ones that show negative log LR scores, so likelihood ratios that are less than one and indicate um, that there's not a match, right? It, it leans more towards uh, no match. Uh, the orange bars pointing to the right are positive log LR scores, so likelihood ratios that are greater than one and indicate the increased probability of a match. So in, immediately you can see that we have three uh, log LR scores that are less than one. Uh, so a likelihood ratio is less than 10. Uh, so very little uh, match. Uh, the, the scores here are very, very low and, and we just eliminated them from any further consideration. Uh, we also had three log LR scores that show a small to noticeable degree of match information, ranging from roughly a log LR of, of roughly two to roughly six. Um, and let me remind you that during human review, the, the human reviewer, there were three offender samples that the human reviewer could not eliminate from consideration. So we have the same result here. Truly, it tells us here are three uh, that you can't eliminate necessarily right off the bat, um, but this only ended up costing us about 15 minutes. So in 15 minutes with the computer, we got the same information that we got um, in an hour and a half from the first search. And really what I, I'm going uh, a little bit overboard on that because in fact, uh, those bottom two, the, the log LR 2.2 and the log LR 1.8, um, we would as a matter of routine eliminate those now <clears throat> without any further consideration because of the KL uh, from this sample, when we get a, a log LR like that, we we typically don't even request uh, confirmation on those. Now, the one of 5.7, uh, we did request confirmation on that, and that was one that was eliminated uh, with the added the added loci being run. But you know, aside from that tangent, um, this shows us or showed us that computer review would help us significantly. Right? There's a lot of time cut out. Uh, from this, but what if we cut out the middleman altogether, right? What if we just eliminate human review for, for this sample or for most of these samples? Since we had already run it through True Allele in our databasing run, uh, what if we just use the computer output instead, right? So instead of trying to sit and manually interpret, okay, I'm gonna put these alleles in, I'm gonna select this for an obligate, uh, maybe I'm not gonna put these in, what if we just let the computer um, do that work for us to begin with? So we went back and exported um, the CODIS alleles for this genotype at a genotype confidence, confidence of 99%, right? So at a 99% confidence, um, the viewer software calculates all of the genotype probabilities that add up to 99% of the total probability, right? And then it provides a table of those alleles that make up the genotypes. So you could set the your confidence for 95%, 90%, 80%, and the computer will do the same thing. It will, it will take all of the combinations of genotypes that add up to that probability and then give you those alleles for all of those genotypes. But for this process, for this review, for this sample, we just chose to leave it at the default uh, of 99%. And so 
this is the comparison between uh, the two methods, the human method which we used at the time and the, the true allele, what true allele would have given to us if we had used it. So the number of candidate matches, well right there, there's a massive improvement. Uh, we went from 30 candidate matches with the human review to now just three uh, with true allele at 99%. Um, the number of searches it would have required that's also massive. Uh, it required us two searches uh, with the human review to identify the offender here. Uh, with true allele, if we had used the true allele output, we would have hit the offender, the actual offender, in the very first search. Uh, would we have needed the victim sample for the hit? Well, with the human, we know that we did because we had to use the human, uh, the, the victim sample, I'm sorry, the human reviewer had to use the victim sample to uh, remove certain alleles, uh, get rid of, uh, assign obligates, and select uh, alleles for upload, whereas true allele had that sorted out already. And no, we would not have ended up needing that at all. Uh, and again, the review time was, was significantly different. Uh, something that I forgot to add to this slide, um, the computer calculated KL for this inferred genotype was around 15.7, right? So close to a likelihood ratio of close to 10 to the 16th. Um, but the MME was only about four times 10 to the third. So it's apparent looking back that, that there was actually a great deal of information in this profile that we never used initially at the time. Um, and also, uh, one other thing too is that um, with this, with using the computer, if we had reduced the genotype confidence slightly, I think it was down to 95%, we would have been able to get a profile that was ENDIS um, capable or, or able to be uploaded to ENDIS. It didn't make a difference in this case. Um, we, we got a hit at Estes, which was fine, but what if that person hadn't been in Estes? What if that was uh, an offender in another state? Well, with the human method, we never would have gotten uh, that profile, but with the computer, we would have been able to do it. So as a result of, of uh, our research, I guess our, our work that we've done with the KL here, we asked our state administrator uh, to create a state-level probabilistic genotyping index, um, which has worked really, really well for us so far. Um, with this index, for us, there's no MME requirement. Um, we have a maximum of eight alleles per locus uh, with a minimum of seven of the original core loci. Now, you may be looking at that and saying, oh my gosh, you know, what kinds of data, you know, are you getting out of that with no MME and eight alleles per locus? Um, I should say in practice, we don't enter more than six alleles and we do look for an MME to, type, to try to reduce the number of adventitious matches based upon the case, uh, the offense and the sample type. Um, we use the computer for review anyway. So, you know, plowing through adventitious matches isn't a horrible problem with, for us. Uh, but we still don't want to mess around with a, a lot. We have a, um, a spreadsheet that, that we've built that's based on the, uh, the MME, the moderate match estimator in, in CODIS. And so um, we will plug the, the output from uh, the review module, the, the CODIS alleles into our spreadsheet and it'll calculate for us an MME. And so, you know, if we see uh, estimated you know, 10 matches at state, 20 matches at state, we'll probably go ahead and put that up. When we start seeing something with 40, 50, 60 matches, we don't, uh, we don't upload those unless it's a, a major case, a murder, and it's the only sample we have. Um, but with the computer review and the ability to, to sort through these pretty quickly, it, as I said, it's not a major problem. Um, the other thing too is, excuse me, similar to the forensic targeted searches, um, our probabilistic index only searches against single source profiles, so forensic unknowns, um, offender samples, arrestee samples, et cetera. Um, the reason for that is because um, 
with the viewer or with, for the, to compare it in viewer, we have to um, know the probability of the genotypes that are, that are matching. And with single source profiles, we just assume a probability of one, right? With a mixture, there's no way to know uh, what that genotype probability is because we can't, we don't know what the other lab has. Uh, so, and so we don't search against them in CODIS because we have no way to resolve those candidate matches. Uh, but we have um, been able to use this to upload a number of matches or a number of samples, uh, mixtures that we previously could never have uploaded uh, to Endus or to Estus for that matter. And we've had a few hits to date. And so it is working for us. Um, so in summary, um, MME is, is a good predictor of the number of matches that you can expect in a CODIS search, but it's not really a good indicator of how much information you have in the data. The KL, on the other hand, is a good predictor of the match strength and also of the amount of information that you have in the data. Uh, there's a very, very good chance that other labs have high information mixture data that's not being searched, right? So there are matches that are being missed. Um, unfortunately, uh, and really in order to search these kind of samples, you need a probabilistic mechanism, a direct allele allele comparison isn't going to work as well. Um, we can make it work to a certain extent, obviously with, with what we have now, but it would be nice if we could just upload, um, all of these high information genotypes and, and identify things. We get matches in our lab. Uh, we utilize the the Trulio investigative database, we get matches in our lab uh, to reference samples, to evidence samples that could never have been uploaded at all, not even to the state index. So there's a lot of information there, but we, you really need a better mechanism to, to see those. And um, that's about all I have. <laughs>